see there. Okay. And um, I think we're done with all the housekeeping, with the polling. Welcome, everyone. And I'm going to hand this over to Sarah and Julia. Take it away. Hi, good morning. I'm Julia Bowman. I am one half of the Birth to Three team at Illinois School for the Visually Impaired. I've been with ISBI for about 10 years um, after moving to Illinois from Boston. Uh, this was a career change for me entering the field of visual impairments. I was uh, previously a chemist, but I was inspired by my own experience as a parent. I'm a parent of an almost 17 year old girl who has severe visual impairments. Um, and as I mentioned, we lived in Boston when she was born and we were part of the Perkins infant toddler program, which that experience was just so positive and so powerful, made such a difference to us that I have focused my entire career in birth to three, because I know that we can make such a great difference at that age. And now I'll turn it over to Sarah. Hi, I am Sarah. I am the other half of the birth to three program at ISBI. Uh, my story is very similar to Julia's. Um, this was a career change for me as well. Um, I've been with ISBI for about 10 years. Um, before then, I actually worked in the actuarial field and I was inspired by my own children. Um, I have two children, both with Lieber's congenital amaurosis. Ethan will be 18 in December, um, preparing for college, and my daughter is 15. And um, I wrote a little bit about them in the blog that Alaya um, was discussing earlier. So like Julia, um, I decided to make a career change. Um, I knew that I wanted to work in early intervention with the families directly um, as they were starting to learn the news about you know, their child um, possible vision loss. So um, we are glad to be with you today. Uh, you want me, are you ready for me to share the screen? Okay. Just a minute, there we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about pre-Braille skills and how Sarah and I work with our toddlers. Uh, so for many of our students with visual impairments, touch is so important. They rely so heavily on their sense of touch, even if they have usable vision. In a typically developing child, they would use vision as their primary information gathering sense and then allow those other senses to be secondary. But for our children with visual impairments, touch can become that primary learning channel and the other senses become supplementary. So then touch is used for all of the activities that make up a developing child's daily routine, such as exploration, play, reading and writing, independent living and learning concepts. So we thought we would share with you today some fun facts about your sense of touch. I hope you enjoy this. So your sense of touch is a component of your somatosensory system, which is a vast network of nerves and receptor cells located throughout your skin, your joints, and your muscles. Uh, there are four broad categories of somatosensory receptors. And in each of these categories, there are many subcategories. But this just to give you an idea. There are the mechanoreceptors, which perceive pressure, texture and vibration, the thermal receptors, which perceive heat and cold, and there are different receptors for each, the nocio receptors, which perceive pain, and the proprioceptors, which perceive your body position in space. And these are the ones that are in your joints and muscles. And in order to decode braille, we need to make use of both our mechanoreceptors and our proprioceptors because reading braille combines the tactile perception of the patterns on the skin, as well as the conformation of the hand. So that proprioception of where the hand is in space. Okay. More fun facts, our fingertips are the most sensitive parts of our bodies. The top three are your fingertips, your lips, and the tips of your ears. So in all three of those areas, there are very high concentration of somatosensory receptors. And in our fingertips, they're mostly those mechanoreceptors. And in addition to having that high concentration, the mechanoreceptors have very small receptive fields. So each mechanoreceptor is responsible for a little radius of skin surrounding it, and that's the receptive field. And so I've drawn a diagram. This is not to scale. It's just to give you an idea of why this is important, how that works functionally. 
So on your back, the receptive fields for each mechanoreceptor are pretty large compared to your fingertips. They're very small. So on your back, let's just imagine that, you know, there are two points of contact somewhere on your back. If they're somewhat close together, they might fall within a single receptive field. And then your brain is going to perceive that as just one touch. So one receptive field, one mechanoreceptor, one signal. So you feel one touch instead of two. Whereas on your fingertips, if you look at those little tiny receptive fields, it's very likely that two points of contact will fall into two distinct receptive fields and then be perceived as two points of pressure or vibration. And so functionally, that means that we can perceive many points of pressure or vibration at once. And you can imagine how that is very useful for reading Braille. Um, the fingertips are also sensitive because we have extra surface area that comes from our fingerprints. The swirls that make up your fingerprints are actually, uh oh, our slide sorry, just sorry. That's okay, I'll keep going. They, um, they no, give you, you more surface have it. area. Do you have it? Is it back? I have it now. Yep, we're back where we were. Yep. So I was saying those fingerprints are actually extra folds of skin that give you more surface area, so more points of contact along your fingertips. And then one thing, the last thing to consider is that dynamic touch is more sensitive than static touch. And with our fingers, we can control that. We can control that we can move our fingers across a texture, across a surface or across a line of braille. And what that does is when we're moving our fingers lightly across a surface or across braille, we are activating the most efficient mechanoreceptors in our bodies. So the mechanoreceptors that respond to light vibration when we're moving across braille, we're making a vibration. And so that light vibration, that signal that goes to our brain is very rapid. It's very efficient. And again, you can imagine how that is useful for reading braille, sending that rapid, rapid signal to our brains as to what we're perceiving with our fingers. Okay, I have one more fun fact. There are no muscles in our fingers. There are two types of muscles that control the movements of the hand, thumb and fingers. First, we have the extrinsic muscles, which are at the base of your forearm and your thumb. And these are really responsible for the strength of our grasp. And we also have the intrinsic muscles, which wrap around your fingers and then work your fingers like marionettes. But both of these sets of muscles need to be strengthened for our little ones to be able to use the Braille writer. And we'll talk about that more later. So now that we've talked more and we've learned more about the science behind our sense of touch, let's talk about how we can help our little ones become efficient braille readers and writers. So we'll start by defining um, what are pre-braille skills. So what, what is this we're going to discuss today? What kinds of activities are gonna, we going to be looking at? So pre-braille skills are a component of emergent literacy. So besides all of the things that we work on with any child who is learning to read, so we're talking about those concepts that we connect from our real life experiences to books, talking about um, the pragmatics of reading a book, you know, uh, pages, front and back cover, experience stories, all of that besides that. There is a whole other category of skills that are specific to children who are gonna read and write Braille. And I call this, this is my own, um, label the perceptive mechanical skills. And they include the areas of sensory, cognitive, and fine motor development. I'm going to break that down for you. So when we talk about sensory, we have to start with tactile perception. So from a very early age, we need to help our little ones understand what their hands are feeling. You know, we're giving them exposure to textures so they can start, you know, perceiving. That is a passive type of touch. We want them to move towards a more active touch, which is tactual discrimination, the ability to differentiate sensory information received by touch. So they can understand that different objects have different tactual characteristics. We also have to include auditory discrimination in this sensory area because when we are birth to three teachers, we work on compensatory skills and that always starts with alerting to sounds, turning towards sound then we start to identify objects by their sound. And we're always working up to that highest level, which is interpreting sound, which is phonological awareness. So the next area is cognitive and that's concept development. 
And as I mentioned, there are all kinds of concepts that are associated with emergent literacy. But when we're talking about pre-Braille, we are going to focus on those concepts that are specific to the sense of touch or our somatosensory system. So we will introduce to our babies the concepts of hard and soft, of rough and smooth. And then we're gonna teach them that some objects have tactual characteristics in common. So then they can start matching by touch. They can start sorting by touch. And then they'll learn in the hierarchy, they keep going up, they'll learn that some objects share all of their tactual characteristics. They're the same. So we teach them same and different. And we don't just teach object characteristics related to touch. We also have to teach those spatial and directional concepts that are related to proprioception. So these are not just for mobility, although they're very handy <laughs> for mobility, but they also have to do with orienting to a page, um, following a line of braille left to right, finding those page numbers, understanding our graphics. So we need to teach those spatial and directional concepts as well. But the most important thing to know is that we can't teach them in isolation, that if we do lessons and you know, bring out activities that are not meaningful to the child, then they won't be retained. We know that we need these children have a context and a structure. And the best way to do that is to work it into the daily routine. Okay, next area is fine motor skills. So we already talked about the hand and finger strength, that there are no muscles in your fingers, but we still need to strengthen those extrinsic and intrinsic muscles in order for a child to be able to functionally use a braille writer and produce legible braille. Finger isolation. Um, we start working on finger isolation pretty young, even before babies are toddlers. I'd say about 10 months, you know, you can get that point. You know, and that is a challenge for children with visual impairments. So we try to push that even earlier. Um, but isolating the other fingers, that happens uh, in typically developing children anywhere from age one to five. So if we want our babies to be ready for Braille, we need to focus on isolating those other fingers earlier, you know, as early as possible to get a jump on that. Bilateral hand use, that's kind of self-explanatory. We're using both hands together, although sometimes our hands are doing the same thing and sometimes they're doing two different things, but they need to be coordinated. And finally, light finger touch. And now you understand why using a light touch is so important if we want our little ones to be efficient braille readers, but they need to learn to control that touch, you know, pressing lightly on textures and really feeling and getting the most information to their fingers. So who do we include when we're talking about pre-Braille skills? I hope it doesn't surprise you that Sarah and I feel we should include all of our students. And whether or not our children are going to be Braille readers and writers, whether they're going to be in a functional program or an academic program, they'll all need to hold a crayon or a pencil. They all need to button a button or zip a zipper. You know, there's so many areas of overlap with handwriting and independent living skills that all of our children benefit from information, um, from these skills, from practicing and gaining all of the skills in this area. And even children with severe multiple disabilities need to have meaningful experiences using their sense of touch. That is just an important component of development for any child. So we work with everyone, but we also are very careful to meet the child where he or she is. You know, sometimes we are just working on grasp and release because we have to lay the foundation before we can build up to these higher level skills. So where do we start now? There's so much to work on. We just saw that this is a huge area and this is an addition to all the rest of emergent literacy. So we need some, some support. We need to collaborate with other team members and co-treat as much as it is possible. Um, you can just see, just looking at the areas that we talked about, there is going to be a lot of overlap with OT, with the fine motor, with the sensory areas. You know, we want to team up and work on these skills together with our OTs. There is overlap with PT because the gross motor skills are prerequisites for the fine motor skills. If you don't have trunk support, you're not going to sit up tall enough and hold a pencil or a crayon. You're not going to be able to use the brailler if you don't have that good head and trunk support. There is a lot of overlap with speech therapists because all those concepts, that's language, you know, taking a sensory input and turning it into a, a, a label, a concept, that is speech, that's language. So we overlap with them. But most importantly, we need to have our families on board. We need to have families understand why these skills are important, but we also need to make sure that we make it work for them. 
So families are busy these days, especially during the pandemic. Families are trying to juggle work, school, you know, ch multiple children going to school and just their daily household responsibilities. And that's a lot. And so we don't wanna add in what they might think of as therapy time. We want this to be very natural. We want it to work into their routines. So one example of how we can do this is just starting with that tactile perception, giving experience with textures. Why, why do we do this? So um, I just wanted to share the results of a meta study. This is basically a literature re review that was published in 2011. And the authors found that the more complex the textures that were given to little babies and toddlers, the more they explored them using their hands and they explored them in different ways. So, and this is compared to a plastic toy. So they were given textured objects and plastic toys, but with the textured objects, they did things like turning them around, shifting them from hand to hand, shaking them, rubbing them, dropping them and picking them up. There was just much more of a tactile exploration there. And babies as young as six months demonstrated this behavior. So we know that's what we wanna promote. And fortunately that just goes hand in hand with using household items. Um, household items are so much more interesting in terms of texture than plastic toys. Uh, and that helps us activate multiple mechanoreceptors at once if we're giving different types of textural input. And the most important thing is though, since they're household items, you're probably already using them in the context of their day. So they can just be you know, a little adjustment, allowing the baby to participate in the routine, and that allows them to have that experience with texture. So I decided to help you get started with this, to have a top 10 textures challenge for myself and Sarah. So we were both tasked with um, going around our own homes and finding what we thought were the most interesting textures. And we both did this within the span of 10 minutes. When you say Sarah, it was very fast. Just things that we use every day that are more interesting than a plastic toy. So for myself, I have many, many baskets in my house. I love a good basket to throw blankets in, throw toys in, throw books in. Um, they might be wooden, they might be rope. There are all kinds of interesting textures to my baskets. I have sponges and I have one for show and tell because it has a nice fuzzy side and a nice rough side as well. I have lots of different sponges, bath sponges, dish sponges, cleaning sponges, all kinds of sponges. Um, brushes, and I, I have show and tell for that as well. I feel like I should get extra credit for this one because it vibrates. Um, that is a face cleaning brush. But we have toothbrushes and hair brushes and just and pet brushes and all kinds of brushes that give a lot of extra um, input to the hands. The onion bag, I have that one for show and tell as well. The onion bag is one of my just absolute hits <laughs> for our babies lately. They love playing with this net texture and stretching it and feeling it and pulling it. And you know, many of us have onions in the fridge. So when you're done with the onions, save the onion bag. Flannel pillowcases gift bows, just because they have like a contour that you can really use a different type of tactual exploration playing with a gift bow. Placemats, whether they be cloth or silicone or rope or the one that I have that has braille on it. Um, washers from the toolbox, that smooth metal, that's a really nice neat texture. And then finally my silicone oven mitt, it has little Mickey Mouse heads on it and so it's very bumpy when you feel it with your hands. So. I thought those were some fun textures and now we can look at Sarah's list. So Sarah is also a fan of the onion bag, which I did not realize is the same as the potato bag, which is the same as bags that oranges are kept in, right? Similar. Um, she also is a fan of sandpaper, which yes, very rough texture and also great practice for light touch when you're experiencing sandpaper. All varieties of sponges, cotton balls and pom-pom balls. Again, good practice for light touch. We'll talk about that later. Recycled Braille paper. Um, I actually have some of this in my house from when I was a student. I kept some of my <laughs> old assignments, but that's just that texture in itself. It's a great way to experience texture. And if a parent is learning Braille and they're able to make some Braille that then their child can feel, that's a good experience for a child. Tissue paper. It's so nice and crunchy. It's so very graspable for little ones too. So I love that especially for children who are working on their initial grasp. 
uh, gift bows. Again, we're on, you know, and you can even have the curly ribbon ones. Those are really nice. They help you get, you know, just tangle the fingers in the curly ribbons for, again, the little ones working on their grasp. Pantry items, you know, pretty much anything that's a dry good. Uh, we have rice, pasta, and beans, and then ones that I would like to also eat, cookie sprinkles and sugar crystals in case, you know, you have little ones that like to put those things in their mouths. Corrugated cardboard, that's another one that gives you a vibration when you move, use dynamic touch. So that's great for practice. And then finally, outdoor materials. Uh, before it's all covered with snow, you can go out and get some grass, rocks, or tree bark. This is all great experience with textures and as you can see, you're probably encountering these things in your daily routine anyway. So just giving the child exposure to these will help them to develop that tactile perception. Okay, so sometimes families need an aha moment. And I'm just gonna tell you a little story about a little girl named Sam who was Sarah's student um, when she was two years old. Well, first of all, Sam had very little functional vision, so it was expected that she would be a Braille reader and writer. And so Sarah began talking to the family about, okay, we should probably be beginning some pre-Braille skills, and she introduced activities that they could use throughout their day to work on finger strengthening, to work on finger isolation, and using light touch. But as time went on, you know, Sam wasn't progressing. You could tell the family wasn't really prioritizing this and didn't seem really important to them. So, you know, Sarah being the great teacher she is, she brought the brailler in. And Sam thought this was a great idea. So she liked exploring the parts of the brailler. She thought that was fun. And she even enjoyed pressing the keys down and scribbling, which is such a great activity for little ones. When she was finished scribbling, Sarah took the paper and gave it to mom. And then we had the aha moment. That braille was not legible. There was barely an indentation on the paper because those little hands need to be strong. You know, you can't just start with, you know, without having that strength in the fingers and make legible braille. So sometimes families need that moment. They need that motivation. They need to understand why in order to get on board. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sarah and she's gonna talk about the activities that we do. All right, thank you, Julia. So from here on out, I am going to share with you some activities that will focus on those pre-Braille skills. Um, some of these activities, Julia and I have come up together. We've shared ideas among us just from working with our own children through the years, um, even working with our students. But we've also gathered ideas from working with other therapists, other teachers, colleagues, and most of all, I want to point out families. I mean, really our families are our number one resource. I can't tell you how many times I'll go into a home and the family has said, oh, let me show you what we came up with this weekend. And it's a fantastic idea because it fits their child's needs. It fits their interests because of course they know their child the best. So some of the greatest ideas we get actually come from the family. So don't you know, if you're a family, don't ever think that you're not doing enough. And if you're a teacher, you know, don't ever dismiss their ideas because they're the greatest. They're the greatest ideas. Um, we also want to, you know, point out that we're well aware that there's a number of activities out there that focus on pre-Braille skills. If you think about it, just during play, just during natural exploration, our kiddos are working on hand strength and finger isolation and um, all of those other skills that Julia shared this morning just during play and exploration. So even when we're not um, putting together specific activities, um, our kiddos, if they're, if they're playing and exploring naturally, then they are getting some of these skills anyway, but we can create these activities, um, you know, to, to kind of, um, you know, based on what are they interested, you know, to really increase their participation. Um, so today we're hoping, um, just because there are so many activities out there and we had to limit due to time which ones we wanted to share, that we really just hope that you can find at least one or two activities that you weren't aware of, or maybe it's an activity that you were doing kind of similarly, but we've kind of tweaked it a little bit so you can change it maybe um, for your child or student. Also, lastly, before we move on to the activities, I also want to remind you that any of these activities can be adapted. So as we share these activities, and if you think, 
this doesn't quite fit, you know, my student or my child, like, I don't know if they're ready for this. Just keep an open mind and think about how can you tweak this, you know, to fit your child's interest and developmental needs. So we are going to start with some activities on finger isolation. Um, the picture on the left shows a young child removing some pom-poms from a whisk. Um, a lot of people have a whisk in their kitchen. Um, maybe they, they use it on a regular basis or like me, maybe not. It's just in the door, right? So it becomes a really useful tool in pre-braille lessons. Um, if you don't have the pom-poms, I mean, think about what other materials you can use um, for this activity. Um, what other materials are in your home? Maybe it's cotton balls, or maybe you have some ribbon that you can um, make balls out of to put inside that whisk. Maybe it's just small toys, like a small car or a small ball or a small block. The point is, is that whatever you put in there, that child really has to work and isolate those fingers in order to remove the object that you've put inside that whisk. Um, I like to incorporate activities with tape um, because it re really requires little ones to isolate those fingers and kind of start peeling and removing that tape. So the picture on the left shows um, how we have taped some objects in a muffin pan. So each space has an object with a piece of tape over it, and they have to figure out how to remove that tape in order to get that object. If you don't have a, if you don't have a muffin pan, you can tape um, objects to any surface, whether it be a wall or a table. I like to use painter's tape because it does provide some nice visual contrast, and also um, painter's tape generally doesn't harm any surface. Um, if you're not wanting to tape any objects, just putting a piece of tape on the surface and having the child pull the tape off or peel the tape is another great finger isolation activity because if you think about it, if the tape's on the surface and how do you work your fingers in order to get that tape starting to peel, you're really isolating each finger to get, um, to get some loose and then pull. Our students and children can also engage in some sensory writing activities, which encourages finger isolation as well. The picture on the top left is the letter A written in cornmeal, and the picture in the middle is the letter C written in cookie sprinkles. Again, think about what you can, you know, what's available in your home. If you don't have cornmeal and cookie sprinkles, what is in your pantry that you can use? Um, maybe it's the sugar that we talked about or those colored sugar sprinkles. Um, even crushed up Cheerios can work for this activity. And you can place whatever texture you use on a cookie sheet so it has some boundaries or within a shallow pan or like a shallow container. Um, I like to do this activity if the child has a light box. I like to use a clear kind of shallow Tupperware um, container and put that on the light box to encourage some participation as well. For our children who are tactile defensive or tactile selective and they're not comfortable touching the texture directly, you can always have them play in that textured material with toys. As you can see pictured on the right, we have a little one um, playing in a, a bin. It looks like a maybe rice or um, I was even going to say maybe popcorn, like those popcorn seeds or something, but you can play in there with um, cars, um, blocks. It looks like there's some numbers and letters. So that encourages um, them to get in and kind of play with that textured material, but doesn't require them to touch it directly. Just a few more finger isolation or sensory writing activity ideas. I know shaving cream is extremely popular when you talk to other therapists and other teachers and they like to use shaving cream. It's great, it has a great smell. Sometimes that's, a, that's a, an interest and a motivator for some of our students. But I tend to try and find something that's edible and safe, um, particularly if they're getting it on their hands directly and they bring those hands and fingers up to their mouth. I'd rather than not taste or eat shaving cream. So I, I try to use things like whipped cream, um, yogurt, pudding. I've even used icing like that 
um, I don't wanna say it's like that fluffy icing. If you whip it up really good, it, it can be manipulated pretty well. It's not that stiff. Um, so just think outside of, you know, outside of the box and what can you use besides shaving cream? With any of these food items, you could also add food coloring if that's um, you know, something that maybe your child or student would need to, to add a little interest if they have some functional vision and you can add some food coloring to that. Um, but again, pictured on the right, very similar to what we had on the prior slide, sorry, it's pictured on the left, is um, some whipped cream on a pan where the child has written a letter A so they can engage in some sensory writing. I should say too, like with the whipped cream and yogurt and pudding, you could also have some temperature difference there. You know, if, if they prefer cold or, or warm, I mean, you could adjust that to what their preferences are as well. For our children who are uncomfortable with getting their hands messy, uh, again, we can make adaptations to this activity. In the middle here, we have pictured a little child playing in the whipped cream with his cars. So it looks like he's getting his hands dirty and he's participating in some finger isolation activities, you know, driving and playing with his toys, um, but he doesn't have to get his entire hand messy. So he kind of gets to participate in this activity at his comfort level. And when he's ready to, to dig in and, and really isolate those fingers and explore, then he can do so when he's comfortable. Um, we can also put these textures in a clear bag um, as we have pictured on the right. Um, so we can create a sensory bag and encourage the children to do some finger isolation exercises that way. Um, these are great for a light box if you have a student or a child that uses a light box as well. You can put any of those textures that we've talked about into a clear bag. You could also use um, which is a common with me. I use clear hair gel and add some food coloring um, and that's their sensory bag for some finger isolation activities. Okay, moving on to bilateral hand coordination. So this is another critical pre-braille skill um, as they will use both hands together to read and write. Um, any activity that requires our students and children to pull a string of some kind um, that will that promotes the use of or the bilateral hand use and, and using the coordination of using those hands together. And not only should we encourage them to use both hands simultaneously, but we also need to encourage them um, to alternate the use of hands, right? So kind of exchange the use of hands in order to complete an activity. For example, if the strand of something that they're pulling, I'll talk about that in a minute, but if something, if a string is really long, we don't necessarily want them to just grab hold and just do one big yank. We'd like to see them exchange, you know, using both hands in order to pull that string towards them. So here we have a couple of activities that will encourage them to grasp and pull using both hands together. On the left, we have a jar full of ribbons and then we have holes cut out in the lid where they can grab, they can grasp um, the end of that ribbon and pull. Um, bilateral hand coordination, they can exchange, you know, using their right hand and then their left hand. Um, they can also stabilize that jar with one hand while pulling the ribbon with the other. So that would be coordinating um, the use of both hands. The picture on the right is uh, of an, I use this all the time. I have it right here. <laughs> it's, it's my go-to. So this is just a Lysol wipe container, which I'm thinking most households probably have uh, some type of Lysol wipe container in their house, um, especially nowadays with COVID. Um, but I wrap mine in mylar paper to make it a little more visually appealing for those kiddos with vision loss. And then I just put a beaded or a string of beads. I cut a hole um, in the lid. And so when this is hanging and you let them know it's there, whether they need some type of tactual um, prompt or not, then they can grab hold of the bead and pull. 
They usually like that clicky sound. I don't want to do it. It's kind of echoey in here, but as they pull, they'll get a click, 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 click sound um, that usually uh, they prefer rather than um, scare them. And this is another um, idea where they can exchange the use of hands, you know, pull with their right or pull with their left, or the longer you make that um, string that they have to pull as you're holding the can and they're pulling hopefully you'll start seeing you know the exchange of both hands as they pull the string you can even have that down on the floor so if they want to get the actual can they can pull the string towards them you know in order to obtain the can okay stringing beads or blocks this is another excellent activity that promotes um, bilateral hand coordination but unfortunately this activity can also be extremely frustrating and difficult for some of our kiddos obviously um, due to their vision loss or just because the beads and blocks are often really small um, just so when we're beginning this beating activity, it just can become so frustrating that everybody just says, forget it. So what can we do so that they learn the same skill, but it's a little more rewarding and easier for them? Um, we like to use pool noodles. Uh, you can cut those pool noodles up to any size you want. Um, I like to use bright colored shoelaces for the string. Um, you can find those bright colored shoelaces at the dollar store. I like to use shoelaces because they already have the tapered end that they can hold on to. Um, I've also used jump ropes. You can cut the jump rope. Obviously, you don't need a four or five foot uh, string as they're stringing beads or whatever it may be. So you want to cut the jump rope. But I like to use the jump rope because the end is easier for some of our kiddos to grasp rather than like a shoelace. You know, if they, if they need something larger to get hold of just for motor reasons, um, the jump ropes are nice. So the picture on the left just shows how we have cut up some pool noodles to use for a stringing activity. Um, the picture on the right, I should have said too, not only pool noodles, but we also like to cut up paper towel or toilet paper rolls because we can use those for beading and everybody has that in their homes. So this is something that, again, uh, you know, it's available somewhere in your home. You might have to wait till you empty the paper towel roll, but then, then you'll have something. Um, I've also, in this picture, have added print and braille letters to each of, to each of those segments um, for my daughter's name, because this shows, um, just shows that for some older kids, you can also incorporate some early literacy um, lessons into this activity as well. Okay, for our children who prefer not to directly explore those textures, we can also encourage them to um, participate in some scoop and pouring activities because again, this encourages this bilateral hand coordination um, we want to encourage the use of both hands. We want to maybe um, really promote the not always using their dominant hand to pour or scoop, you know, use your right hand for a while. And then I want, want you to scoop and pour two times with your left hand. Um, and again, if we're using like a big bin or they're scooping from one container to another for that bilateral hand use, as they scoop and pour with one hand, we want them to use their other hand to stabilize that container. So we have three pictures here, just showing different ways you can incorporate some, some pouring and scooping activities. And the first is just removing um, some seeds from a muffin pan with a little teaspoon and pouring those into a couple other containers. Or on the top right, we have like a rice bin or maybe even like a crushed Cheerio bin. And again, they're just scooping that texture and adding it to you know, another bowl. Um, in the lower right, it looks like those little tricks or those colored Cheerios that they can scoop and pour from one bowl to another. Scooping and pouring, again, in the bathtub, we talked about routines or Julia mentioned routines earlier. This activity is something that you would not have to take any time out of just while they're sitting in their bath. They can scoop and pour um, water from one bowl to another. 
All right, moving on to hand strength. So the in the middle here, we have pictured some ketchup bottles. I find these at the dollar store as well. They're great. Um, many of the children I work with, including my own when they were little, they just really loved having like wind blown in their face. So these activities take that into consideration and then add something. So we can add a little scent to that. So not just blowing wind in their face, but then they can also get a fantastic smell. So I like to soak cotton balls. Um, you can go to the dollar store and get the oils. You can usually find those by the candles or think about what's in your home. Again, there's maybe vanilla extract, there's, there's um, lemon juice, maybe there's some liquid soaps or shampoos. I mean, there's just so many things with smells within our home that you can add, you can um, put at the bottom of these, if these bottles, you know, soak a cotton ball with whatever liquid that may be, put that in the bottle. And then when they squeeze, um, they will get that smell. So, and then they can also differentiate between what are they smelling? You know, is that vanilla or is it lemon? Um, while, while they're squeezing, again, we don't want them always using their dominant hands. We really want to encourage them to squeeze these bottles you know, with their strong hand and then take turns with their weaker hand or again, using both hands at the same time to encourage that bilateral hand use. I've also used these bottles um, outside of bra braille, but to motivate movement. When kids are starting to roll or crawl and they really like the smell of vanilla or cinnamon, cinnamon's a popular one too. Um, we've stayed very close and have squeezed those bottles so they've gotten that smell and all you know they'll start rolling or they'll start crawling and so we can back away so they keep purposefully getting closer to us so just thinking outside of the box of how we can use this to really um, make progress in all developmental areas other items you can add to the ketchup bottles to promote the same skills if you're participating in any crafts you can add glue you can add glitter to the glue so when they squeeze that out um, they're participating along with their peers. You can add paint. We'll talk about some foil paint here coming up. Um, or you can take the paint and the kiddos and some paper outside. And like I had pictured on the right, just let them squeeze the paint out of those bottles um, and have some fun. You can add water. Going back to bath time, let them squeeze the water in the bathtub. And now that it's the holidays, a lot of you will be baking. I know Julia will. And you can be adding the icing to the ketchup bottles and let the kiddos help with decorating the cookies. Also to promote hand strength, we can use or put different textures inside balloons. You can use different colored balloons for the kiddos um, that have some functional vision. Um, you can use different materials like dried rice, dried beans, you know, sugar, cornstarch, ice, Play-Doh. You can really put anything in there and think about like that will affect how it feels depending what texture you put in that balloon will um, determine how that balloon feels. It will depend, it will change the weight of that balloon, how easy it is for them to squeeze that balloon to get some hand strength. Um, if you put ice in it, it going to change the temperature as well. So there's a lot of learning in this activity. Um, you can also just cut up some sponges and they can squeeze their sponges, whether those are wet or dry. Again, this is an activity that could be done in the bathtub um, or outside if you're in a warmer climate than we are right now. Um, and just let them play around and develop some hand strength. Okay, light touch, another one that Julia had talked about. Um, light finger touch along with finger isolation and concept development can be promoted with some of these activities. So pictured on the left, I have a roller board. Um, I also have it right here kind of. I just, it's just made up of those green kind of like scrubby sponges. Can't think of their direct name. Um, and then I get hair rollers, all of this again at the dollar store. And then the child just with the light touch, they can just move those rollers um, up and down or side to side on the board, 
a lot of kids like that sound too. So it's a good cause and effect activity um, because as they move the roller, they like they get rewarded with that sound. You can also use cotton balls. Um, as pictured on the right, we have a dark piece of paper with ripped up cotton balls. And this really encourages, or we want to encourage the child to move those pieces of cotton ball from side to side or up and down. Um, if you don't have cotton balls, you can use checkers. You can rip up other pieces of paper that contrast with your surface that they have to just lightly touch um, and move from side to side or up and down. Whichever activity you choose, you can also throw in um, that concept development. Remember when, they're, when they are participating, say, oh, you're, you're moving the roller up or you're moving the roller down or you're moving to the left or you're moving to the right. Using those directional terms to describe their movements also help with the understanding of a braille cell, top right or top, I'm sorry, <laughs> top, bottom, middle, left and right. Couple other activities um, to promote light touch include bubble wrap, foil, and paint. So on the right, we have an image of a little hand on some crumpled up foil. So foil painting is a fun exercise. You can ball up a piece of foil and then, and then unfold it. You don't want to flatten it. You want to have those creases so, for, so they have some tactile feedback. Then you can simply add paint to the foil and have them finger paint on, um, on that piece of foil and they'll get some tactile feedback. If you have paint in those bottles, they can squeeze it on. So we can combine some of these activities um, and they're working on all kinds of pre-braille skills at once. You can use brushes or sponges if they don't want to get their hands in that paint. So we don't want to not include them in the activity if they're a little sensitive, we just find ways to adapt. So it's okay if they need sponges um, brushes, or you could even cut up fruits and vegetables and let them start like stamping the paint onto that surface. If you don't have foil or if you have some bubble wrap, this is just another nice texture that they can participate in some finger paint exercise and um, work on their light touch. And we have that pictured on the left. Again, for the kiddos that have some tactile sensitivities, if they don't want to touch the paint directly, we can bring those toys back out. We have pictured on the left, a little boy, he's painting, but he's painting with his truck. And that's okay, that's what he's comfortable with. He's participating in the activity. He's using light touch to move that truck back and forth on his paper. Um, so he's accomplishing the same, the same task as whether he was using his fingers. Um, we can also put the paint in a clear baggie and just let them, you know, kind of swirl the paint around. This is great, again, on a light box. If you have, you, this activity can be done right on the light box surface. And then pictured on the far right is another idea for someone um, who may not be comfortable with getting their hands messy. This is a picture of bubble wrap that's um, wrapped around a dowel or a roller pin, and then the paints on that. So the child does not have to pick, touch the paint directly and get their hands messy, but she can use a light touch to roll that roller pin back and forth. Um, and she's completing the same activity as her peers. All right, tactile discrimination. So there's a lot of activities that we can incorporate um, some tactile perception, tactile discrimination, concept development, um, hand and finger strength and finger isolation. So tactile discrimination is so important. Like Julia had mentioned before, when we start um, being able to identify whether a texture is the same, whether it's different, or they're starting to recognize and identify what those actual textures are. So some things you can do within the home you can simply cut up cardboard pieces. Um, I make just like little cards and then I attach a texture to each card and I usually do at least two. So two are always the same. So here I have like a burlap, which I know is really hard to see. Um, this one, I just have different beads or 
Another one is just soft. So it's whatever textures you have, but I add a texture to two cards. And then on the other side, which you wouldn't be able to see, so I have texture on one side and then on the other side, I will include in braille what that texture is, just so the child starts recognizing and can start exploring that braille and then the texture itself, putting that association together. And then as they're flipping the card, that's actually helping with wrist rotation, which is extremely beneficial. Um, as more cards are added, then they can engage in sort of like a sorting or matching game, you know, finding all of the soft cards, following, following all the bumpy cards or scratchy cards. Um, you can also scatter these cards around them and use those positional turns, use those directional turns to help them find them. So, you know, the soft card is next to your left foot or the rough card is behind you. So we can make all sorts of games out of just textures and cardboard um, that you can find in your home. You can also add textures to clothes pins. Um, really hard to see, but just a strip of those same textures, you can add those to clothes pins. So as they find the card that matches to the clothespins, then they have to attach the clothespin. So this is really encouraging some finger isolation and some hand and finger strength. And remember when they're opening the clothespins, we want them to alternate which fingers they're doing. Some fingers are gonna be a little more difficult to open that clothespin, but it will encourage some strength. If clothespins are difficult, you can use chip clips. Sometimes those are easier because they're bigger. So um, that's an adaptation that can be easily made. You can also texture the sides of boxes. So you have four textures. This is pom-poms, this is soft, this is rough, and then I have smooth. And they can, again, same idea. This isn't a matching texture, I understand, but it's just to show an example. You find the side that matches and you can clip the clothespin on the side of the box. If they're not ready to match textures, they can just clip the clothespins and you can start counting, just start some concept development. If you don't have a box, you can use the same idea with a paper plate and just add textures, kind of like think pizza, and you can add textures and then they can clip um, the matching texture near the one on the plate. All right, tactile discrimination. We also use shape cards. Um, you can create raised shapes using pipe cleaners, wiki sticks, or puppy paint. Um, for more experienced hands, just because uh, they don't need such a high raised surface, you can also just use tape because they'll start recognizing where the difference is. Um, for beginners who maybe aren't ready to identify and recognize shapes or letters, that's okay. Having them just explore those textured cards um, with both hands is beneficial and a pre-braille skill that we're looking at. So this, we just have a few pictures here um, of shapes uh, made out of pipe cleaners or puppy paint, um, even some letters written with some type of raised, probably like puppy paint or glue. You can also incorporate shape cards into tracking books. Tracking books help the young learners get used to exploring those textured pages with both hands. You know, as they open a book and they take both hands and really start searching the page for those textures. Um, again, you can create those raised lines with those puppy paint, wiki sticks, pipe cleaners. Uh, if you have access to a braille writer, you can create tracking books with braille lines. I like to make pages just um, with lines of full cells or maybe one line of dots. And then I'll put something at the end. Maybe it's a really fun texture that they like or a raised sticker. So as they track the line and they get to that texture that indicates, you know, it's the end, it's a stop. And then they get some type of tactile award for following that line. And then the last I have to share with you today is um, creating books to help with tactile concepts. So this is probably one of my favorite activities to do when working with families because we really get to incorporate the child's interests, um, you know, and focus on 
the skills that they need at that time? You know, what, what concepts are we working on for, uh, with them, you know, to, to understand so we can really individualize this lesson for these kiddos. So I've included a few examples. The picture on the left, I have pictured three different books. Um, so the top, the top one with the two stars is a counting book. Um, and I have it here. So on each page, like here I have one star and then the next I have two and then I have three. Um, and I've just used like puffy raised stickers. And then I've also included the large print and the braille. So again, this just really encourages the child to start exploring. They're finding that braille. Of course, they may not understand what that braille is saying, but it's just the same. They understand, um, you know, just like, kiddos who don't know how to read print, but they know it's telling them a story, right? So as they feel the braille, they understand that it's associated. Um, so we've got some concept development, a lot of pre-braille skills um, just by creating that book. Then I usually, actually I should have shown you this one first because this is usually what I start with. It's just a texture book. I just add textures, one texture to each page um, so this is crinkly. Again, I have the print and the braille, soft, um, smooth, you know, use whatever is in the home or use whatever the child prefers. So this is um, usually what I start with when we start making books with the families. Um, the last one I have there at the bottom is a directional book. So I usually have some type of raised or puffy sticker. I put it in different positions on each page. So here's top and then bottom, and then obviously I would have one on left and then right in the middle. And this book in particular helps with developing that understanding of the, of the braille cell, top, bottom, left, right, and middle. And then the, pick, the book on the left, um, this just shows a book with raised lines that we can e easily make and focuses on different concepts such as long and short, as you can see, that's three lines, you know, which line is the shortest, we can make some curvy, we can make some straight, you know, which line is straight. Again, it's really just encouraging them to explore that braille, explore the different textures, um, discriminate, you know, identify like what's different here, what's the same. Um, and so you can really individualize these books. And what's great about these books is then we can just lead them with, with the family. All right, so those are all of the activities we've shared today. Here, um, I think Elias shared these links in the chat. This just connects you to some of the other webinars uh, with Family Connect. Um, we've also, Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, the creating CVI Simple Strategies for the Home Environment is another webinar that we had done that should be out there, correct? Yes, yeah, it is. Okay. There's the link for YouTube. Okay, and then the Creating Learning Environments Within the Home. Um, and then I'll just leave here. This is our contact information. So we always say, please feel free to like either give us, you know, a call or a text or send us an email if you have questions because I know we always say if you're like us you'll think about it later on and something will pop up so all right well I am going to stop sharing and then we can take any questions okay great thank you so much um oh my gosh the chat was like exploding while you guys were presenting which is a good thing exploding in a good way um just people appreciating all this information and they're going to share this with everybody that they can um there are a couple of questions one of the questions um that i have here is so do you start your braille with grade two braille i do not I start with uncontracted. I start with grade one. Typically, uh, well, that's just where what I do. And also, we're all, we're typically teaching our parents the same too. And so, um, I, I've had that question come up more often recently. But I've I have just never personally started off on grade two. I've always started grade one. So it doesn't matter as far as which 
board books we get, I don't care if they're grade one or grade two for them just to be, we're just doing, like I said, basically the pragmatics. We're feeling the braille and knowing that there's a story, right? And so that it doesn't matter as far as when they're reading. Now, and as Sarah said, we're teaching the parents. And I just think it's another one of those motivators. If you teach parents how cool the Braille code actually is, and one of those things is how the letters, you know, there's the pattern, you go A through J, and then you add the dot three and you go the next 10. And it's, they, that is a motivator. Parents are like, wow, you know, that's really neat. And anything to motivate parents to learn Braille along with their child, you know, because that's such an indicator of success in Braille literacy. So I feel like grade one, at least teaching the parents you know, to just master grade one is just a great way to have them be involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Julia. I mean, when we start just having them explore and we just want to see those hands just all over that page, I could care less whether it's grade one or grade two, you know, because they don't understand what that braille is anyway, when we're telling them the story, but they're starting to make that association, but they themselves obviously can't read the braille. So I agree that it it's just depends what your goal is. But if like starting to teach them, then I would teach, I personally start with that grade one. But if it's exploration purpose, yeah, whatever we can get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good idea there. Uh, good suggestions. Um, there was somebody just had in the chat wiki sticks. I don't, did you guys mention something about wiki sticks or? Yes. I think go. maybe that's what it was. There was no question mark with it, but it just said wiki sticks. So oh, I don't know. Maybe yeah, that's some, what it Sarah, I don't have any on me, but they're just, they're like strings dipped mm -hmm. in wax. And so they're moldable yep. strings. And so they make a really nice raised line. They stick. Yeah. I mean, but they <laughs> like not permanently, like yeah. you can peel them off. You know, and I almost put them in the box to I share know. to in there in my basement. <laughs> Darn it. Well, you can always Google it too. Wiki yeah, it's no, W no. it's yeah. W I K I S T I X. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Ben yeah. too. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was a question about where do you get a braille placemat from? Oh man. So remember my daughter is almost 17. <laughs> Someone gave that to us when she was a baby. And I think it came in one of the braille book bags that we got when she was very young and it's called read a mat. So maybe you could find it on eBay somewhere, but I don't think it's made anymore. The one that I have. Um, but yeah, it had the alphabet. Yeah, mat. they used to give it out in the, I want to say it was like National Braille Press or something. Yes, it used to give like for a, everyone bag. Yes. Yeah, but they, yeah, you can't find them anymore. I like you said, unless you Google, you know. Yeah, maybe on Google or, because um, I know, well, yeah, the free bag you can get from Seedlings, but there's nothing in there. No, that I don't, I'm, I, yeah. Read a mat. That's what it is called. So maybe that'll What help. was it called again? Read a mat. Read a mat. Read a mat. Like, read a mat. Got you. Okay. Oh, hmm. somebody said oh, Max yeah. the Age has them. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. well, maybe she means wiki sticks. Or oh. map. <laughs> do you, Susan, do you mean wiki sticks or or the mat? <laughs> the oh, the placemat. Awesome. Oh. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. That's really good to know as well. Um, okay, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, you said the benderoos. When you have a child. Uh, who is delayed and is starting braille a little older, how do you get the light touch? Okay, so we are still working on pre-braille skills at almost 17 because, you know, she's a functional, she's in a functional curriculum, but we always still want to work towards that. Um, so there are lots of different ways. It's, I usually find if we have a texture like the sprinkles, <laughs> that that'll, she needs to have a light touch to make them stick to her fingers so that she can eat them if it's something motivating for that child and that for mary is eating the sprinkles or the candy so if she just smashes them they go everywhere right and she won't get any but if she uses you know of course she wets her fingers and sticks them in there lightly she can get some to eat so that's just my personal <laughs> right off the top of my head activity um ideas for teaching skills in remote learning well, that's what we're doing now, yeah, that's right there. I mean, I don't know, you wanna go first? Right, right. that's what we've been doing. Um, what, since April, since March. Uh, so the way we work it is we come up with activities um, 
And I know that, I guess I shouldn't speak for Julia, but contact our families, you know, beforehand um, to give them an idea of maybe what activities we're thinking about, you know, what, what do they have in their home um, so that they're prepared so they can participate in these activities. Um, yeah, I mean, that's learning. exactly what I do. I send the email with our Zoom link and it says, do you have any of these five things in your home? These, this is the skill mm -hmm. I wanna target and we can find any one of these five ways we'll work on that. And so usually we can come up with at least one. And then like Sarah says, the family will typically come up with something better in the mm -hmm. middle of the session. You know, for example, we were playing with an egg carton upside down and I wanted her to like poke straws through it, you know, and pull out the straws. Well, mom found that veggie straws <laughs> were more motivating so she could pull them out and eat them. I mean, parents come up That's with great. Great. They had them in their home. So I didn't think veggie straws when I was planning my activity, but for remote learning, that's what it is. We set up, we have a goal. We're very clear with our parents, what the goal is. And then what can we find that you already have in your house that we can work on that goal. Mm -hmm. And I even have some families now that, you know, we, we know where we're going. We know what we're working on, what we're focusing on. Um, and we meet, you know, over zoom and I've got a couple families, they'll have three or four things already prepared. And they're like, okay, this is what we, this is what I was thinking today. What, where do you want to start? So yep. it's really, they've really taken the lead. Um, you know, it's, it's not been, um, it's not been as bad as I thought, you know, I mean, you get the right families and you, they've really taken the lead with the right, you know, with the right guidance. And so yeah. like, sir, if they're motivated and they know why, mm -hmm. why are we doing this? Why is it important with all of the, you know, things that we shared today that they really do. If, if we've had those conversations and they feel empowered, they do, they take over. They mm -hmm. do. So it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we want. Mm -hmm. And both Julia and I also have done porch drop offs. You know, yes. we've dropped off materials. Absolutely. We've, you know, if the families are unable to get out or maybe they're, you know, financially um, are unable. Um, you know, Julie and I have both um, put together packages. Um, our program has helped put together packages and we've done porch drop-offs so that they can participate in activities. Yep. Now that's an excellent um, like problem solving thing that you can do is, you know, if they don't happen to have those things in their house or they can't, like you said, they can't get out and go to the dollar store or anything like that to be able to, to like, you know, consumables to drop off some things that they can use um, and not, you know, uh, unless you have a family who, you know, will return something just whenever you just have in your mind, what you're leaving is basically going to be a consumable and yes. it's for them to use and it's for them to keep. Yes. Well, and that's what's great about like the activities we use. I mean, honestly, it's either you find it in the home or mm -hmm. we go to the dollar store. And, yeah. um, you know, I have no problem with, you know, if I have to go and get five things at the dollar store for a family to participate because they need yeah. a muffin pan and they, you know, they need yeah. a couple bows or, you know, or a bag of dried rice. Like, that's fine. I'll, yeah. you know, I'll go put that together for them and drop it off. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and what you're doing that, you, especially now that you're having to do it over Zoom, I think it's really helping that coaching and collaboration piece even more so. Like, I think, like you're saying, parents are motivated and they're being empowered. I think they're probably being more motivated and empowered now that we have this, that you're not in, you're not physically there. So now, you know, so in, in some ways, it's like been a, a really uh, I mean, even more empowering situation, you know, that, uh, that they're, they're seeing why you're, why you're doing what you're doing with, uh, with their child and they're, and they're leading it, right. Which is what they're supposed to be doing is, you know, it's a family centered thing. Um, well, and I think what's nice too, about a lot of these activities is now that the siblings are home as well. Um, many of these activities, you know, obviously we should have always been including the siblings, but now the siblings are usually yeah. right there. Yeah, and the older um, so, siblings. Yeah, and the older. Nice. So it's what's really great about mm -hmm. these activities is that they can participate in them too. I've had siblings mm -hmm. put the sensory bags together. You know, oh, they're the nice. ones creating the sensory bags. They're, the, you know, and, and they're doing these activities alongside of the child that we're working with. So I think that's been really beneficial too for, yeah. for everyone. So it's nice. Yeah, it's really because it is. It's a family thing. I mean, it's not just one person that's with the child 
you know, maybe used to be, right? During the day, it was just one or two people. Now everybody's home. And so and it's really- That works out so much better, especially if the siblings are just a little older, they need that attention too, because otherwise yeah. it's hard for parents to be there with both kids at the same time. So if they're all, you know- They're all together. For a common goal, it might be not mm -hmm. the exact same thing. It might be different parts of an activity, but as long as right. they're working together and they feel like they're all acknowledged, you know, that really. Right. Works. Yeah, that's important too. You're right about the other kids. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, we're, we, we're working on, you know, we're trying to do it with this one and the rest are like, well, what about me? <laughs> well, and so, so yeah. to go back to like those, that sensory writing activities, I mean, yeah. Most of the children I work with are not going to be writing letters in sensory bags, to be honest, but they're going to be, you know, that the idea wasn't necessarily writing letters, but for them to isolate their fingers and kind of play around right. in those oh. textures. But maybe their older sibling is learning letters so they can have, they can be doing the same activity, you know, while the sibling's mm -hmm. actually writing letters, the children that we're working with are just isolating and maybe just playing around in it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's nice so that they can do yeah, that something is together. So yes, mm -hmm. together. Exactly. Um, there was a question here about what is the Braille on the placemat? I, we know where to get it from. Maxi yeah, April, what the is alphabet. on there? It was like Apple and I know car. I know pig was on there. I don't remember. It's all. a word for each letter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So many squares. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let me see. Oh, oh no. I know, I don't think they make them anymore. What? Oh, the mat? Yes. Well, the, somebody said that you can get them on Maxi Age. Yeah, and then she said they, they're not there. Oh, man. That's not good. I will hunt for these. <laughs> if I find them, I'll let a lie know. <laughs> yeah, so we can put that out there. That would be cool. Um, let's see, somebody. Somebody, it looks like just they put a comment. I tell my kiddos tickle touch straight across when tracking a line of braille. And I touch the back of their hand lightly to show them tickle touch, like how it feels. Mm, okay. That's pretty good. That's um, good. Let's see, another comment. If you plan the things you wanna do over the next few weeks, make a list of what's needed. The family can gather what, what they have and you can send a package of the things just like what you were talking about. Uh, you really wanna use if they don't have them um thank you for all of your remote learning information I'm just scrolling down always a pleasure to attend your sessions of course I, that's why i said that's something that we always get and uh, that was from carol you guys know carol otten <laughs> we love her <laughs> um let's see yep somebody said they can't find them on there any longer so yep you're right uh i guess it, oh man we need to like do a whole like a writing campaign. Tell them we got it. Us back. <laughs> uh, well, and of course there was a comment about you can make your own placemat by putting the braille labels on. Mm -hmm. You know, which yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, it's just nice when it's done for you <laughs> already, right? Or use a cabinet liner for braille placemats. So, or Megan uh, says that they use a cabinet liner mm -hmm. for braille placemats. So. Um, I'm trying to see if I missed any questions. I'm trying to scroll up. We had like about 150 attendees. So we had a lot of questions and comments <laughs> in the chat. Oh, somebody, oh. <laughs> is this something APH can make? There you go, Alaya. <laughs> uh -huh, right, there you go. <laughs> I have to talk to our product people there, <laughs> our early intervention, our early childhood people. Um, oh. Uh, this we're putting together a Christmas list for our little one. So would love a list of, of top buy items for family, et cetera, in addition to all these amazing build ideas. Hmm. I thought I got an email about something, uh, some, I forget what organization, but was having a uh, webinar about uh, gift buying. Hmm. So do y'all have any? Well, how old, how yeah, old is the old. child and do they, is it light perception or any functional vision? Let's see what they, uh, that, this is from Amanda mm -hmm. Benedict. So Amanda, 12 months, 12 months and yes, some vision. Do they have a light box by chance? Cause I'm just thinking of different things you can use yeah. on a light box. Oh, yes, to the light bar. Excellent. Magnet tiles. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of your last session, our last session, Sarah, all the things we did on the light box. So it's, mm -hmm. if you want to watch our previous webinar, yeah, <laughs> that's really true. The, the CVI, 
The CBI uh, session? Yes. Even yeah. things just like Sarah had the plastic uh, clear solo cups, and then you can draw patterns on them. Yeah, you can uh, just take your markers and yeah, draw pictures on those solo cups. I love the things. Ikea bowls and plates. I love those for color matching. Um, what other things did we put on the light box? The uh, Alex bricks are Legos that you can do on your light box. Um, pegboards. You can do pegboards on the light box because the mm -hmm. holes come through. Oh pegs. yeah, like a like the what is that? Oh my God, the light. What is the that toy? The light bright. The light bright, like a light bright. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Real. That's but very. It, those are very tiny for little hands. I have not. Oh, that's had true. To do that. that's but, like, the, but if you had like a, a regular pencil. pegboard that was like um was it discover discovery to that's i think Probably. somebody else may make it i don't even know if discovery yes, toys is still thing. The, the yellow the yellow board because it has the holes all the way through so when you use that on the light box it shines mm -hmm. through and then those yeah that used to good. be from discovery yeah discovery yeah. toys i know what you're talking about exactly and the pegs I know are exactly different colored so those are um it's a good contrast. And then you can also stack the pegs on top of each other. And so whatever you put in the gift bag, put mylar tissue paper in there and then save it because you can use that to decorate anything yeah. for your child that throughout their daily routine will help them attend to it better. Like the white box, you can decorate the white box with some mylar tissue paper. You can decorate toys like Sarah did with her bead can. So whatever you end up getting, get some mylar tissue paper for your gift bag. <laughs> And then and keep I also add toys though, like if you're like actually going to a store and buying toys at 12 months, I would find toys that, that really isolate like those old fashioned toy phones where they yeah. have to like put their finger in and yeah, order to make it go. Mm -hmm. um, those are great. Start isolating the fingers, you know, for pre braille. So anything like that where he has to, you know, um, I like the puppy on a string. You know that black and white yeah. string? Hold, yeah. hold, hold, hold the little puppy. Mm -hmm. So cute. And they're simple. We don't want the toys that light up and do 10 things at once. Mm -hmm. No. We like the ones go to the basics, like your most basic toys you can find mm -hmm. that work on one thing at a time. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the best. Those are the most effective for our children because, you know, they don't have that instant information from their vision. So they can't take all that in at once and process it. So we want them to really have those simple toys. Mm -hmm. Those are our favorites. And maybe Oops. even any type of container play. Um, there are toys out there where like if they drop something into the container, it would give like maybe play some music. I know mm -hmm. my kids used to have a fishbowl. So when they drop something in, it would like make the water kind of sound. Um, so they get some type of auditory feedback um, that they've accomplished that task. Um, and that's going to help with some bilateral hands, you know, coordination, yeah. Yeah. concept development. Have you seen things. those little pianos that they only have like four keys? Mm -hmm. The little tiny and yeah. they just make a little tinkly noise, like a little xylophone. Those are good for finger isolation too. I like, again, very simple. Mm -hmm. I yeah I think that's really good advice like just the simpler even though for us it doesn't have all the bells and whistles but for for our kids that we you know that again they, that sensory integration they're not they're not you know ready for all of that at one time it's easier for them to focus on one thing and then right. add others to it I, I really that's really good um, and advice. even the best toys can't compete with a shiny disposable pie tin I'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> really, you can do so many things with the pie tin. It's great. Yeah, and they're cheap. Oh, bang, bang, bang on it. You know, working on that banging and get two of them and bang them together and make symbols. I mean, really. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. The 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 simpler the better, and they still. Yeah, because can I tell a story you know, while they're still before. on here? Yeah, and they're, so, well, when you talk about the simplest, because when my kids were little. Um, I remember one Christmas year, I thought I rocked it. Like we had it. We had the best presents. This is going to be the best Christmas. And then of course we had their stockings. Um, and in their stockings, we had put like those little cat bells, you know, the little colorful bells with the, the balls with the bells inside um, so that we could do some activities. They could care less about the hundreds of other stuff that we had got them those cat bells <laughs> balls were all they wanted and i said after that christmas that's it that's it that's all like like those 
silly little cat balls was yeah. like made their Christmas. Yeah, so, egg shakers. I have a similar story with the egg shakers yeah. I put in her stocking and that's all she played with for forever. Yeah. Yep. That's an awesome story right there. It's just like you get the big, you know, the big, you know, toy and the big box and all they want is the box. Forget the toys. Exactly. For you. It was just the little, just the little bells. Yeah, exactly. that's a, <laughs> it's an excellent story. 